This week on Dine Drinkly, the podcast. I love when we talk about national media and national attention for Northeast Ohio restaurants or breweries or distilleries or bars or anyone because it kind of gives us a good comparison versus the rest of the country. And Northeast Ohio, Ohio in general, is really knocking it out of the park when it comes to craft beer. Cleveland Whiskey, they just recently opened a new location downtown and it is a huge project. Like he took over this building that was built in 1911. Basically, if he didn't take it over, they probably would have torn the building down. And now it's on the National Historic Register and it's a huge kind of whiskey haven. Yadi and I, um, in all of the rankings that we've done up to this point, this is the furthest we've been apart seemingly on our numbers. We're still in negotiations about who is right and who is wrong. I'm Alex Darris. Josh Duke is off this week, and you are either watching or listening to Dine Drinkly, the podcast, where each and every week we are joined by Cleveland's best and brightest food experts, insiders, and influencers to talk about all things food, drink, and more in the greater Cleveland area. Today we're going to be talking about the Great American Beer Fest, uh, some winners in Cleveland, a new Cleveland whiskey location, and some of the upcoming projects that the Cleveland.com Best Of team is working on. So first we're joined by Mark Bona. Hi, Mark. Hey, Alex. So Great American Beer Fest just happened and Cleveland won some big awards. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is a biggie. I often describe this as the Super Bowl for brewers. It's extraordinarily competitive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this year, seven breweries in Ohio won. Of those seven, two are in Northeast Ohio. Both actually are in not only in Cleveland, but in downtown Cleveland, and both are actually about four blocks apart. Two very talented brewers and breweries. Masthead Brewing Company uh, won, uh, won an award, won a bronze for IPA for Aliens. That's a West Coast style IPA. And Noble Beast Brewing Company, just a few blocks away, uh, brewer owner Sean Yasaki won a bronze for, uh, excuse me, won a gold for Eau Rouge, a Belgian style sour ale. So, the interesting thing here is that style is that's a very specific beer. Yeah. So that's a that's a tough one to make. Sean is an extraordinarily talented brewer. Uh, and by the way, both of these breweries have won before. So this is not, they're not one trick ponies by, by any means. Yeah, I think your story said there was almost 2,000 breweries. And yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> it's really amazing. So Masthead wins, wins a bronze in West Coast style IPA. And that is a very, very competitive category. It's one of the top two competitive categories. There's scores and scores of different groups. Uh, but there were so many uh, breweries here. 1,800 breweries submitted 9,200 entries, entries as in beers. Wow. So it is really tremendous. Now, overall, a little bit of a down year for the state, but still a very solid run. Last year, we had 13 Ohio breweries win 19 medals. Four of those breweries were in Northeast Ohio. We win consistently. The Ohio Craft Brewers Association, a nonprofit that lobbies on behalf of Ohio Craft Brewers uh, has said that since 1987, about I think it's 209 breweries have won award, have won medals at GABF. 72 of those medals are gold. Wow! So they there. This is important. I love when we talk about national media and national attention for Northeast Ohio restaurants or breweries or distilleries or bars or anyone because it kind of gives us a good comparison versus the rest of the country and Northeast Ohio. Ohio in general is really knocking it out of the park when it comes to craft beer. Yeah, and with these two uh, styles of beer that won, and obviously you said they're four blocks away from each other, can people go downtown and try them at the brewery? Are they available or...? They can. Uh, IPA for for Aliens is available at Masthead. And Sean told me, Sean Yasaki told me that he is going to be having the Eau Rouge available very, very soon. That is an aged beer in what's called Foders. These are giant wooden tanks uh, to age certain styles of beer. And you've got to be very 
you've got to be a very good brewer to do this, and you're really fighting. Um, you're fighting fighting biology. I mean, yeah. you really you got to be careful about the. You got to control the bacteria. You've got to be very careful about this. Uh, I can't wait wait to try that one. I mean, I'm not a big sour fan at all, but this is a very intriguing one. It's a European style, and I really. And he's just such a good brewer. They both are. So uh, I that'll be available, uh, if not this week, probably within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, cool. So it's it's like, yeah, like you said, it's always impressive when any of the restaurants or brewers, distillers, whatever, get the national attention. But then it's kind of cool that we get to go up the street and get to try it without having to go to these big competitions. Yeah, and I want to point out that this competition is also very – controlled as well as competitive. And when I say controlled, they it is blind judged. They jump through a lot of hoops to make sure that the judges are not aware of what the beers are ahead of time. They they go through a lot of really security type measures. I talked to a judge a few years ago who was telling me about it and he said and it's really extraordinary. So these guys, the point is they're really earning these medals. Yeah, for sure. And and they don't need to have like the the flashy name or anything like that. It's like the beer is speaking for itself. Right. This is where marketing does not count at all. I mean, marketing has to count on store shelves. That's why you see more colorful, crazy uh, imagery on, on beer cans nowadays. And that's fine. They're trying to grab our attention. But this is, no, this is, uh, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. And kind of similar uh, with the craft Brew new craft brewery news, um, but not as exciting. Acronym Brewery uh, just announced they are closing. I know we you did a story a few maybe last month that they closed their Medina outpost, but now they are closing for good. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, I guess a little bit of a surprise. I mean, the, I guess you can say the writing was on the wall when they announced that the Medina location would close in late September. And then a couple of weeks later, they announced, announced that the Akron, the flagship location over on East Market Street would, would also close. Akron made some very good beers. Uh, several years ago, we did at cleveland.com a, uh, a best brewery competition, and we tried a lot of beers from a lot of places based on a uh, popular vote. We narrowed them down, and they finished in, I want to say, they finished in the top two. Out wow. of, and it started with a couple dozen breweries. I mean, it really was tremendous. Uh, in a good location, and, you know, just as they said in their social post, changing circumstances. And I'm wondering if this is a harbinger for, or a continued harbinger for what's going on, economically speaking, with breweries in that region. Because Lock 15 was uh, taken over by Brew Kettle, so that was a preservation move, and that's good. Arche also had two locations, both in Akron, and they both closed. Uh, now you have um, Acronym closing. It does leave uh, a couple of, of good ones and longtime ones. Hop and Frog is still around, as is Thirsty Dog Brewing Company. They are uh, different, but very they make very specific beers, and they're doing a good job. So it's worth keeping an eye on. But, yeah, sad sad to see acronym has closed. Yeah, not even just, like, in that region, though, too, but we just talked about a couple episodes ago how Pulpo and Willoughby closed, and they, too, it was the financial aspect. So it seems like... Unfortunately, like with everything, when rising costs, it's it's not that easy to just start a craft brewery anymore unless you have a good chunk of change to do so. And Yeah. It, I mean, the problem, you hit the nail on the head on one thing. There's two things at play, I think. Number one is financial challenges, the fiscal challenges. I think we're still seeing, it's kind of like a hurricane in the tail winds that kind of whip around for days after the eye of a storm. Same thing with a lot of industries where the supply chain is uh, still kind of challenged. We're, we're still feeling the residual effects, I think, of COVID in a lot of ways in terms of businesses. So fiscally, there's an issue. And then the second issue, and we've talked about this before, is that there is a changing demographic. And this is not judgy or good or bad. It's just that generations drink differently. And for the first time ever, young drinkers in their early to mid-20s, and I don't want to say exclusively in their 20s, but primarily, are in a way shifting in a lot of different directions. So you're seeing canned cocktails becoming very popular. Cocktails, as you know, better than most people, have really made a resurgence over probably the last decade, I'd say. Um, and then adding to that, you have the non-alcoholic segment, which is definitely not a fad. That is here to stay for quite a while, I think. Yeah. 
so you know why these things are happening i don't know i think palettes change things change it, again I, I don't think you could judge one generation over another it's just something that the breweries need to adapt to and they are yeah and i'm working on a story about wine right now but i've been talking to some of the um wine experts at restaurants and they, i've had a couple of them say now like oh cleveland's a cocktail city and it's just funny because i feel like 15 years, 10 years ago, we would have said, oh, we're a craft beer yeah. city. Like, that's what everybody, but it, it, it is interesting how things are shifting. And I think you're absolutely right with the non-alcoholic. It's not going away at all. Like, No, it isn't. Yeah. And kind of similarly with uh, drinking, I recently visited the Cleveland Whiskey, which I'm sure you are familiar with. It's behind a lot of bars. Uh, they just recently opened a new location downtown in the industrial area of the flats. It's at like 601 Stones Levee Road. And it is a huge project. Like this, uh, the CEO of Cleveland Whiskey, uh, Tom Licks, he took over this building that was built in 1911. Um, it was the Consolidated Fruit Auction Company in Cleveland for a while, and basically it, it went through a few iterations of manufacturing, was totally like left in shambles. Like he said, there was no window there that wasn't broken, there was no plumbing, no electricity, and basically if he didn't take it over, they probably would have torn the building down, and now it's on the National Historic Register, and it's a huge kind of whiskey haven, so not only is Cleveland Whiskey going to be able to um, totally ramp up their production. They already have, but they're going to have a huge tasting room, tours, a bottle shop. He's eventually going to put a kitchen in there. They have a huge up upstairs space uh, for events that looks like the best like wedding venue with views of downtown. And, and it, it's really cool kind of what they're doing down there because I think he said by the end of it, it's going to be probably a 20 million dollar project but it's like it's an interesting time for them to move into this area of the flats because you have this bedrock riverfront project downtown tons of money going into that um tom also bought the building across from where the cleveland whiskey production facility is so they took control of a decommissioned street so they're going to be having concerts and flea markets and things like that so it's just it's kind of cool to see this new area be revitalized and it's kind of all centered around booze too. <laughs> I, I agree. And I thought your story was also interesting, but you had a lot of information in there. And, and one of the interesting things was he had the opportunity to essentially tear down this old building and start from scratch. He decided to take more of a renovation approach. And he said in the end, it's going to cost me more. But I think that's kind of cool. Clevelanders respect the past history and nostalgia. And then you touched on the location. This is pretty much, if I have it right, located between Scranton Road and the Gateway District. So mm -hmm. the arena and the stadium are right there. It's in the shadow of the Gateway, basically. You're going to be having, we are going to be having the Peak Performance Center, the uh, joint venture between the Cavs and the and Cleveland Clinic is going to be opening down the road. We're seeing a revitalization of an area, and you're right. I mean, a lot of it is centered around booze yeah. or drinks, but if it's if it's working, it's working. Yeah, and it's it's kind of cool to see because I mean, I feel like people, like I remember my parents always talking about like, oh, the flats it used to be back in the heyday, and then it kind of died, and now it's back, and it it's cool to see it's not just like East Bank, West Bank anymore. You have like Brewdog, you have Cleveland Whiskey going into the industrial area. And like you said, it's like kind of untapped for folks going to the stadiums or something like that. If, cause I know they want to make it a little more of a like pedestrian friendly area. Uh, he wants to buy the lot across the street and add some benches and stuff and have people who are doing kayaks or canoes, they can park over there and, and get a drink and keep going while they wait for the uh, freight boats or something <laughs> like it's, it's kind of a really cool concept and it's just, again like untapped area in cleveland that it's on the water it's right downtown and and like you said the historic part is it's really cool like just to walk in and you see i mean tom was just pointing out to paris wolf and i went and visited and uh there's part of the bricks that are all burnt because there was a huge fire there or they have the huge doors where they would have um like the buggies with the trucks like back in with all the right. fruit. like it's it's you see how it functioned back in the day and and like you said it's it's a huge financial undertaking, but I think 
it's so well worth it for having that building stick around. So. Yeah, for generations before both of us, I did a piece a, a few years ago on Jim's Steakhouse, which was the iconic place to go, located not far from, I think, from where you're talking about where Tom Licks is going to be bringing in the new, or has brought in the new Cleveland whiskey. And it's amazing how many people came out of the woodwork to talk about, you know, the nostalgia and what it was like, and they're really into it. So it's really nice to see people now kind of take take that on and, and you know, respect the past but embrace something in that's here and now and into the future. And Cleveland whiskey is unique because I know you drink cocktails and, and liquor more than I do, but they've he found a way a while ago that I believe is proprietary to kind of speed up the aging process. Yeah, it's almost like Cleveland whiskey. If you ask Tom, he says they're a technology company. Like they're not yeah. a boost company because of the <laughs> way um, the aging that they do. It's really scientific and stuff, but... Basically, they can infuse um, wood flavors into whiskey that you can't make a barrel out of. Like oh. a, like an apple wood, it would be too... Basically, if you try to age whiskey in an apple barrel, it would fall apart and hmm. not work. But the way that he does it with these... I mean, and in this new facility, they have like a whole woodworking facility looking area. Like it's wow. it's really crazy. And, and just cool too that... Um, like it's Cleveland, it's staying in Cleveland, it's in the heart of Cleveland, and I think having it in the old building, like we all love the new, the new kind of modern concepts that come to town. They help bring a lot of business to town. It keeps Cleveland up with a modern area, but I think projects like this is what makes Cleveland Cleveland because it's keeping the heart of the town. Yeah, I've said this before. It we need you need diversity in every shape and form. You cannot have the like fifteen steakhouses downtown. It's not going to work. Fifteen of anything. You've got to have differences because it will bring different people down and more people. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, lots of lots of fun booze news in Cleveland <laughs> this week. So and now we're joined by Peach Carrion. Hi, Pete. Hey, Alex. And so you and Yadi Rodriguez of the Best of Team are gearing up to do steak sandwiches, best steak sandwiches in Cleveland, right? Yeah. Well, uh, fast, fast and fast casual chains. Uh, we picked out uh, a total of, let's see, I think twelve different shops, and across those twelve shops, twenty-one different sandwiches. So we're in the midst of putting those ranks together and. Uh, that should be uh, out, I think, this week. Wow. That story. So, so is it just Philly cheesesteaks? Like, like, what's the criteria for the sandwich? Criteria, essentially, is a Philly cheesesteak. So you're talking about the shaved beef with uh, either uh, melted sliced cheese or um, crumbled cheese or cheese whiz, uh, onion, uh, mushroom, and then some other places will add some other things to them, too. One of them, is a, one of them as I recall, was a queso a cheesesteak, which sounded really interesting, sort of leaning in that sort of southwest direction. So, um, yeah, a lot of, lot of, you know, sort of variations on on the cheesesteak. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to get to talk about my favorite sandwich oh. in Ohio that is not in Northeast Ohio. Have you heard of Wario's in Columbus? Of course I have. They have the best. Their steak sandwich, they make like the house cheese whiz, it's like the fresh bread, the shaved ribeye, like it's so good. And they've done, um, I think usually with Cordelia on his fourth, their birthday, they'll mm -hmm. come up and do collabs. So sometimes Clevelanders get a chance to get this sub, but I think I, I want Cleveland to get a Wario's really bad. <laughs> you know, if that collab happens anytime soon and you don't tell me and you sit across from me in the newsroom, I'll be upset. It's, so you better let me know. I've had people who... They're going driving home from Columbus, and they'll text me and say, "Do you want me to pick up a sandwich?" Because they they know. So. Well, see that that I like. And I'm a huge Philly cheesesteak sandwich fan, anyway. Yeah. So um, I'm equal opportunity on those. You know, just hook me up, and I'm I'm ready to roll. So that sounds exciting. Yeah. And so, out of the places that you're looking at, are there any that you have a personal? You already know you're gonna like it, or any you're specifically excited to try, or it's kind of it looking like we've kind of been through all of them already so i have tried them all um on our list and they were all really good in very different ways uh, some of them sort of landed better than others i have to admit that my most recent mr hero cheesesteak like even though it doesn't quite hold up 
to some of the other selections that we have. I mean, McAllister's is on the list and Quiznos is on the list and, you know, sort of the usual suspects. Uh, Charlie's, which is, I think, oh, headquartered yeah. in Columbus, or at least they were at one point. Oh. Um, Charlie's Cheesesteaks. There's a whole bunch of different ones, um, but that Mr. Hero one, I think, was probably the first one I had as a, you know, a greater Clevelander, and I still love it. There's something about it. It's just the way that it all comes together, even though it's not what I would identify as being, you know, S tier or top tier, yeah. you know, it is definitely like serviceable, like to the nth degree. Like I could eat one of those any time of the day or night and be completely happy with it. You should do ranking the whole Mr. Hero's menu. Oh man. Yeah. That... Would you pick their Philly cheesesteak or a Roman burger? Oh, I would pick the Roman burger over a cheesesteak. And that's not a slight to the cheesesteak. It's just that that Roman burger is just, you know, I mean, I talked about that in Classic Lee Eats about five or six months ago. That's just one of those sandwiches that I could eat anytime. And <laughs> it's 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 almost perfect. It all just kind of comes together in this beautiful, melty, wonderful, exciting explosion of flavor. Fair enough. <laughs> if you say, if, if any Mr. Ma- Hero people are like looking at me now like, yeah, send him hey, a gift card. Yeah, a gift card, right? <laughs> or something along those lines. Um, but, okay, so something else I think if you just... Obviously, people from Philadelphia, they'll say you can't get a good cheesesteak out of Philadelphia. And I think Cleveland, we're not like a cheesesteak city. No, we're not. And there are a couple of different places in the last few years have like sort of purported to have a Cleveland cheesesteak sandwich. And I'm I'm drawing a blank on which ones there are. There was one on Waterloo where uh, you could do the bocce bowling for a hot minute. I'm not sure that there is a Cleveland cheesesteak sandwich that is somehow special or better elevated than anything an actual Philadelphia cheesesteak sandwich has going for it. If you haven't done the comparisons like on a trip to Philadelphia, yeah. I highly recommend it. I mean, I did the I did that the last time that I visited uh, Philly. It was like Pat's and Gino's, yeah. and then you know we ran down the road to Tony Luke's and got one of those too. And their their porchetta sandwiches are really good too. That's so that's favorite. something you definitely want to have. Those are so good. But um, I think you owe it to yourself if you're gonna be out that way to just do that. And you know, Pat's and Gino's are literally across the street yeah. from each other. So there's like no excuse for not kind of doing that. I'm sure they get a lot of people that come in just to do that. Yeah. And when you're like, so what do you think it is like? that we in Cleveland can't figure out about the cheesesteak? Like, do you think it's, like, the actual meat or, like, how it's cooked or, like, the bread or the cheese? Like, what – or all of it. Like, do you think there's one part that we, like, aren't good at? I don't think it's that we're not good at any of it. I think it's just there's a magic that happens because it's sort of a Philadelphia specialty. I mean, you could get a good serviceable, you know, cheesesteak – pretty much all over yeah. Greater Cleveland. And there's quite a few places that do them pretty well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't think that we do anything wrong necessarily. I think it's just, you know, you leave certain things to the experts. And any any person who's from the Philadelphia area will be listening to this podcast going, uh-huh. I was going to uh-huh. say, don't even. Leave before, it to the experts. Um, this episode, I was trying to do research and put best Philly cheesesteak in Cleveland on Reddit and don't even bother. <laughs> no. Not going to get anything no, out. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. No, but um, so, yeah, so lots lots of cheesesteaks, 21. Yeah, we had uh, 12 different shops, 21 different um, sandwiches in total. Um, Subway obviously, you know, makes it, you know, because it's a, it's a fast food sort of choice for a lot of people. But, you know, we hit all of the other ones, Quiznos and Potbelly and Penn Station um, McAllister's, which is relatively new around here, even though um, sort of outside the Cleveland area, people are pretty familiar with it. DeBella's and Firehouse, um, those were part of the uh, sort of equation to Dave's Cosmic Subs. So we, you know, we made the rounds. Can you give any teasers as to either something that was so, one place that had a sandwich that was so delicious, you remember it, or so disgusting? You know, I really... Um, Nothing was disgusting, to be honest. Wow. No, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm kind of an aficionado when it comes to um, there wasn't food. any like chewy <laughs> no. steaks. No, no, actually, they all do steak 
pretty well, but there are very there are gradations and variations of like who does it, you know, a little bit better. Um, I really like as a fast food cheesesteak. I like Penn Station subs a yeah. lot. I think they're really good. Um, I've always been a fan of Charlie's, even dating back to the late '90s when they sort of kind of came into my purview. So, and they've had a resurgence around here pretty recently. Yeah. So, and seem to be like reestablishing themselves in the you know Cleveland market. So, um, they definitely have improved. I think their game and are poised to move and do some other things. Um, so, Charlie's definitely was one of those for me. Um, even Quiznos was all right. I mean, some of the other ones, though, like, you know, Subway and Panera, those are kind of, you know, I don't want to. Panera wanna... has a Philly cheese thing. I know. Isn't wow. it strange? You know. Panera's menu is really different it from, really like, is. when they first kind of started. Yeah, I feel like they're kind of they're kind of clutching at straws trying an to figure crisis. out. identity crisis. Maybe. That might be part of it. But I also think that, you know, anytime you, you know, start to do menus by committee on that scale it's going to get weird yeah you know there's a lot of people in corporate boardrooms that are starting to make decisions where normally it should be somebody in the kitchen making a decision this has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about but did you know that zoop is now zeets it's what so zoop the restaurant that was like soup yeah i think they wanted to be known for more than soup so now they're zeets with a Z on each end. That's zilly. I know. That's it. That is just like <laughs> totally reminded me. It's like, who is I? Li- Zoop. That's their branding. Open but the door for a dad joke. There. Sorry. I maybe just, I they have Philly cheesesteaks there because they have more than soup. I don't know, but, <laughs> but I'm not sure that that's the best branding I've ever heard. I mean, yeah. Zoop was all right, but Zeets. Yeah, I know. I just I've been really thinking about it a lot lately. <laughs> Help us out. Help us figure that one out. But um, yes, so Philly Cheese Steaks, check out cleveland.com slash dining. It'll be up soon, and you can see what Pete loved the best. His, him and Yachty's top three. This is funny, too, that Yachty and I, um, in all of the uh, rankings that we've done up to this point, this is the furthest we've been apart, seemingly, on our oh. numbers. So this is really interesting. I think she was... Um, surprised by some of my choices and I was surprised by some of hers and we're still in negotiations about who is right and who is wrong. I will eventually be wrong because that's kind of how it goes. Yeah. But, you know, what are you going to do? So, but it's fun. We, you know, we had fun sort of debating all of that too. You know, finer points of what makes a good cheesesteak. Yeah, I think that's what's fun when you guys do these specific like menu items too. It's like you get to be really nitpicky about it. It's like you know you never dissect a sandwich that much when you're just regularly eating. <laughs> no, you, you know it's fun. You really don't, and I think that's part of the fun of it. And then it's really fun to take readers along for the ride and sort of help them to understand where we're coming from, even if it seems like we're diving into like minutia um, to the nth degree. It is fun, and I think um, people will be surprised when they read the list. Yeah, so check that out. It'll be fun. Thanks so much for listening to or watching Dine Drinkly, the podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Dine Drinkly, and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at cleveland.com slash newsletters. 